to sleep Dream of our love and a future so sweet Dream of the days that are waiting out there Of all the joy our family will share Now you're here And you're more than we had dreamed of Now you're here And you know within the world of you I thank my God who has answered our prayer And delivered you safe in his care your sweet head mom and dad will pray for you and put you to bed we'll be your friends as we're watching you, grow. Watching you grow help you learn the things you should know Good morning to everyone. Good to have you here today. I think we've got some fun songs, exciting songs to sing this morning. I'll save the surprise for a few songs from now. So if you don't mind, let's stand as we sing the first few this morning. <clears throat> Staying with our Christmas hymn theme. Go ahead, David. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, Lord, the King of angels, oh, come let us adore. Shall see. 
And now a little, I think this is a singing tree. How many have never sang the Hallelujah Chorus? You've all sang it? Oh, some, some have. All right, enjoy this. Go ahead. Hallelujah, 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 amen. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. I'm going to watch a video, uh, self-explanatory. Just enjoy it.
All of you today on this uh, wonderful California-like warmth day. Um, very strange. Um, praying for that snow on Tuesday for a white Christmas, but it's so good to have all of you here today. Uh, if you are a guest with us, especially if you're a guest uh, on the video today watching us on live stream, just want to say welcome to you. Uh, so good to have you. Uh, I want to make note that there is a card in the seats in front of you if you have a prayer request. Uh, please fill those out and put those in the offering basket in the back as you exit. Uh, I have a few announcements. There's a little bit going on. We've really, the first couple of weeks of December, there was just so much going on with Angel Tree and Operation Christmas Child and various things. And so we're kind of getting to that slowdown period. But tonight, uh, there's a potluck for young adults. Uh, we are providing the ham and drinks and desserts. And we just want the young adults to bring a side dish. And uh, we're also going to do a white elephant gift exchange as well. So those are always a lot of fun when you get both the gay gift and then the really good gift and then the fights begin. So I uh, hope you can join us at our house tonight at 5. Uh, next week will be a coffee and conversation. We've got a number of uh, kind of important uh, body updates to share with you. And then the plan is to have what, Bella, tomorrow? Donuts. Donuts and coffee so she's been waiting for like eight months since the shutdown for us to have donuts here so I know she's excited she'll be here I'll be here so that's good uh, and then lastly uh, coming up uh, Christmas Eve which is Thursday night December 24th from 7 to 8 p.m. we're gonna have a special time in here of worship we're gonna sing 10 or 12 uh, Christmas carols uh, read from scripture and then have a short time short lesson about the light and then we will pass around uh, the lights uh, as we light candles that we'll have. Uh, as you can see, we're starting to add candles. We're going to have a few more. And I think it's just going to be a beautiful, worshipful, uh, just really nice time to 
remember this season. So we hope you can join us. Uh, if you want to invite a friend, there are postcards uh, on some of the seats and also in the back that you can hand out with information. And uh, once again, just so good to see everyone today. All right, a couple more Christmas hymns. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Silent Night. And then I'm going to use, before communion today, Joy to the World. Think about that. Go ahead, please. Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end he will reign on david's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness for that time on and forever Good morning, I'm Don Emerson. And just as a reminder for anybody that's new to our church, we'll be using the all in one cup, cup for communion with the bread wafer followed by the, uh, the fruit juice. So with that, um, Tom texted me last night that joy to the world would be sung prior to communion. So I kind of looked at that and reading between the lines, I thought, oh, he must want me to tie joy to, no? Okay, well, bear with me. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, bear with me as I, I work my way through this and uh, try to tie joy to the world to the Lord's Supper. Um, there's three stanzas out of Joy to the World that always kind of stand out to me. The very first one, Joy to the World, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. The next one, Joy to the World, the Savior reigns. And I believe the last one, he rules the world with truth and grace. So a beautiful Christmas song from my childhood. 
Uh, I was not raised in a religious tradition, and I never really knew what the song meant. I just thought it was a great song. I always thought it was an awesome song when uh, sung by, by a choir. So we'll, uh, we'll come back to that as we talk about the Last Supper. And, and so as a new Christian, uh, having read through the Bible, I'm, I'm working my way through it for the third time. When I think about the Last sup Supper, I still struggle with the knowledge that Jesus knew it was to be his Last Supper with his beloved 12 disciples. His Last Supper before being betrayed and handed over to the Roman soldiers for crucifi crucifixion under the scheming of the Pharisees and Hebrew leaders. The story of the Last Supper seems negative, at least to me, with, with uh, sad and gray, grave overtones. It seems to serve as yet one more example of man's inhumanity to man. As a new Christian, I still have to kind of dig into the scriptures to realize the amazing positives from this story. That God did fulfill his promise to man. He sent his only son, and his son, Jesus, paid the price for our, for our sins. He defeated death and gave us hope for eternal life. So when I go back to joy to the world, it's much more, it becomes much more than just a friendly old Christmas tune uh, from my childhood, especially that first stanza, joy to the world, the Lord has come. So Father, as we partake in the bread, we give thanks for your son, for your son who has come to show us the way. We reflect on our own hearts and ask for forgiveness, and we ask for guidance that we build our relationship with you. Lord Jesus, as you instructed your disciples, we too receive this bread in, re in remembrance of you. Amen. Father, as we partake in the wine, we again give thank thanks for your son. Each time I take communion, Lord, I want to recommit my life, my heart, my thoughts, my everything to you. Fill me today with your powerful spirit. And as I leave this place, help me to hold this fresh remembrance and the story that never grows old close to my heart. In your precious name we pray, amen. That concludes Lord's Supper. If you're online watching, uh, or if you're here, for those that are here, we're not passing the basket. There's a basket in the back uh, to leave your check or offering. And if you're uh, with the live stream, we have online or texting. Never used those, I don't know how they work, but some people use them, so I'm glad, that, glad that's an option to you. Um, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I love this time of year because it's about giving. The whole world gives, and um, as Christians, we get the opportunity to do that every week, and uh, we're going we're gonna to do that now. Um, and I just ask that to, you join me in prayer as we think about uh, his sacrifice and, and his example of giving. 
Father God, we are just so very blessed to know you and we're so very thankful for Jesus and what he's done for us and continues to do for us. And, uh, and we're thankful that you set this example of giving and that we can follow suit and, and do that and be reminded of that sacrifice in, in what we give. And we just ask that you bless every uh, dime, every dollar, every minute of sacrifice that uh, is given uh, in service to you. And we just ask that uh, you, you bless these monies in this time. It's in your, might, in your mighty and holy name we pray. Now we're going to sing a version of O Holy Night before Scott comes up. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. On your knees, oh, on your knees, That was wonderful, everyone. Uh, good morning again. Once again, my name is Scott Falkowski, and I'm so glad to be back with you here today. Uh, it was so good to be gone so that uh, Terry and Derek could kind of figure out the word sanctuary for us so I didn't have to deal with that. So, uh, <laughs> but in all uh, honesty, thanks, Terry, for teaching last week and bringing us uh, the background on Hark the Herald Angels Sing, such a wonderful carol. And so we've been going through uh, the great Christmas carols, the great hymns uh, of this season. And uh, today we're going to talk about O Holy Night. Uh, so far we've looked at three. Uh, the first one was O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which words are, uh, for that carol are probably the first Christmas carol words that were put down on paper, uh, maybe as many as 1,700 years ago. Uh, and then we talked about O Little Town of Bethlehem and really put in some historical cultural perspective to help us understand 
what the author was feeling and experiencing when he wrote that, which really even brings that uh, simple hymn uh, out even more and makes it more powerful. And then last week, a hark there, old angels sing. I mean, Charles Wesley, that just blows me away. Over 6,000 or 6,500 hymns. Just to, That was his ministry. That's what he did. And so many of them are in our hymn books. It's just wonderful to have uh, that record uh, of his words and his expressions, his poetry, his songs about Jesus. But today, as I said, we're going to talk about O Holy Night. O Holy Night, when we sing through it, we've sung through it, we listened once, and we sang through it a second time. I mean, when you, this hymn, at least to me, this carol to me, when I hear it, especially the version that we have, I just feel peaceful, calming, um, maybe even silence, although that doesn't work when you're singing, but just that experience. But what's interesting about this particular carol is it's really not what it seems when you look at it that way. And so I just want to say as we start this out, and I think we've already experienced that with all three that we've gone through, you cannot minimize the depth, the spiritual, the theological depth of these Christmas carols. And uh, I really appreciated what Don said about, uh, you know, it meant something early on in life, and now it has much more meaning, as it could even lead us into the Lord's Supper. And so a couple of things come out as we look at this particular, it's only three stanzas that we're going to go through. That's all that have been written down. And so the first one deals with the human condition and our need for a Savior. It establishes we live in a fallen, lost world, We've got some issues. We can't do them on our own. So thankfully, in comes stanza two. The Savior has come. And then lastly, so since he has come, how then are you going to live? And what's really interesting is we look at this particular carol, and as I said, it's not, you know, there's a lot of depth there, but, but it's even not um, as it seems sometimes. And the version that we have that we just sang is different from the original. And so, as I said, the, these carols, they just have something behind them, and it's always important to understand what's going on. Um, I was watching a documentary on Friday night. Uh, I kind of get to do that when my boys are gone, and I kind of have the TV to myself, and I can watch something that they could care less about. And there was this really fascinating documentary on PBS uh, about the Jewish influence on our modern Christmas carol. Okay, catch that irony there for a second. But it was fabulous. Uh, they talked about how Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was written by a Jewish man who had been picked on a lot while he was a kid for being Jewish. And so that's what comes out in that fun song. There's actually a lot of depth there. Um, another one that just really blew me away, and I had uh, no clue about this particular aspect, but one of my favorite Christmas carols is, do you hear what I hear? I just love that, the imagery, and when it's sung well, oh, it just brings me into the throne room. Do you hear what I hear was written about the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So when it talks about looking up and seeing things, this was a world in the Cold War that thought that we could all perish at any minute. What's really fascinating, and I don't want to go too into this and think too much of this, but the woman who wrote the words lived next to John F. Kennedy as a child, and a lot of the United States at that time wondered if John F. Kennedy was going to be the savior to keep us from going into the Cold War or being taken over by the Russians. Like I said, these hymns, these carols, they just blow you away when you hear more about them. And so we are going to look into the history of this one, and I think you're going to kind of be shocked when you hear the depth and what was going on in our world when this one was written. And so here it was. Like I said, we listened to it, and then we just sang it. What are the phrases or words that pop out to you as you sing this wonderful carol, O Holy Night? What's that, Annette? The soul, felt its the soul felt its worth. Kathy? The stars, which we talked about in our class today. I love it. God, how he brings things together, and we talk about the stars and that glory and that majesty. And stars are 
really apparent in a lot of this, and we're going to get to that in a second. Other phrases or thoughts in O Holy Night? Oh, hear the angel voices. Could you imagine being those shepherds and hearing that chorus of angels? Because I'm sure angels all have perfect voices like the guys in the video, is my guess. And it sounds amazing. Other thoughts? The thrill of hope. Ah, I love that. Hope is so important, isn't it? I think we all have something we're hoping for right now. <laughs> for sure. Did I hear you, Don? The king of kings. The king of kings. And we're going to look a lot at that. There are a lot of amazing phrases and words in this that hopefully as we sang them and as we look at them will pique you and the Holy Spirit will speak to you. I love that one line down at the end. Christ is Lord, oh praise his name forever. So let's do that now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we praise your name forever. Just as Randy talked about today in Psalm 145, you're just enduring praises and thankfulness. And especially at this time of season when our hearts and so many people's hearts are, are focused on thanksgiving and gratefulness. We are so blessed that we know who that comes from. And Lord, we are so blessed that your son would break through as a baby in this small town of Bethlehem, walk among us, and die for us and would be raised again and is the king on the throne. May we always be reminded that as kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but yours doesn't. Yours is eternal. So Lord, may your Holy Spirit fill this room, fill the living rooms of people watching their computer screens and TV sets, and may we just have a special word from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so background. This is quick background, unlike a couple of the other ones. And so this was written in 1847, uh, leading into the second French Revolution, if you will. And I'm sure Aaron, the history guy in the back, will probably correct me, but hopefully he does that later on, not in front of all of you. But um, so, uh, you know, French Revolution has happened a few decades before this, and, uh, you know, we all know the history behind that. But then there's still unrest and unease in France. And so he writes this, uh, Placide, and I'm not going to say it, I wish Bryce was here since he took French, but Placide Capu wrote this in 1847, took three weeks for him to write the words and then for a composer to put it to music, and then it premiered on December 24th, 1847, uh, at this church uh, in Rougamur, France. I'm doing my best. And so... It was also part of dedicating a stained glass window. I don't know if the stain, this is the stained glass window, but this is a church in Rogamir. And so this was just a wonderful event. And these words in this song kind of precede going into their next revolution called the February Revolution a couple of months later. So there's a lot of unease, a lot of unrest in France when this is written. So when we think about some of the words and you know, if you're talking unrest and unease, don't you want just a holy night? The stars are brightly shining, just worrying about those types of things. And so that's where we get it. But here's the deal. Like I said, the original here often doesn't look like what we just sang. And so that's what I want to look at, comparing the two of them, because there are some things that are brought out by Placide that don't necessarily come out when John Sullivan Dwight writes it in the English version just seven or eight years later. And so think about some of the language that's used by Placide. He came down to wipe away our original sin. Notice how that kind of changed. I mean, he goes into, I'll say, kind of almost dark, difficult circumstances in his version of this that the Savior also came to end his father's anger? Those aren't things that we commonly see in a good old Christmas poem, right? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer comes down in anger. No, you know, and it's, that's what he's trying to bring out because of what he is experiencing in life. He wants that holy night. He wants peace. He wants a true king to come. Think of the revolutions in France. The difficulty, if you're a king, probably don't want that position because they think the kings continue to fail. 
And so we want the king of kings. And so John Sullivan Dwight, so here's, here's what makes this kind of interesting. So he is a Unitarian, he is a humanist, and so he rewrites this, okay, from that perspective. He's also an abolitionist. That will come up in a couple of stanzas. That kind of brings new meaning to the chains being broken, etc. And so when we look at these two together, I think there's just an extra power that comes when we see the original. And I love the one that we have now. Don't get me wrong. But he presents Placide, and both of them really present just the fact that we're lost, that we are messed up, that this is a messy world, that there's a barrier between us and God, and the only way to break down that barrier is for God to come down among us and send his son. As we talked about two weeks ago, it's God breaking through our timeline to provide an answer for us. I get a sense of desperation as I look for this, right? There's a, you know, this whole thing is going to be a crescendo. The desperate plight of human beings needing a Savior, and then the Savior comes. God's beautiful gift to us. The whole world trembles with hope. Just these beautiful, we want peace, we want hope, we crave that. And so a few verses as, as we think about the human condition, all the way back into Genesis, thousands of years ago when Adam and Eve fell and Satan was there tempting them, even at that point when God is saying, here's the discipline for what you did, discipline comes with your actions, you wanted to be like me, no, you need to worship me. And so God, even in those disciplines, says, well, a time is going to come where there will be a descendant, capital D in the NIV, who will come later on, and he will be the victor. He will be the Savior. And then, going into Romans, of course, and I believe Sean mentioned this in our Bible class today, for all have fallen short, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is our human condition. And then on... Uh, Friday as well, when I was talking to uh, my boys before they headed off, we did a little Bible study, and I was reminded in 1 Corinthians 15, where there's this discussion of the human body, the life that we have now, and what our resurrection life will be later on, the resurrection body. And you see words that are just really difficult. It, the human body, is sown and perishable. Okay, I have to, I am totally in line with this right now, unfortunately. In the 11 months I have been here in Helena, Montana, God has been protecting me while Satan has been attacking me physically. There is no other way to explain the fact that I get out of Michelle and Cody's car yesterday and I've been having a, a, a back spasm and I just take one wrong move and I can't walk. I hit it very well, but I was cringing. And so I've had things like that hitting me, hitting me, and hitting me. And trust me, I am the one who cannot wait for that body that's imperishable, that's not going to have these injuries, the COVID, all the other things that we're dealing with. But that's the body we have here now. More words. That body, our life is sown in dishonor. It is sown in weakness. It is a natural body, but there is a spiritual body that will come. And so that's our condition without a savior. Perishable, fleeting, painful, <laughs> emotionally and physically. And so we yearn for that savior. So next stanza. And like I said, this is, there's just beautiful words when you look at the two of them together. Focus on the king of kings, which Don brought up earlier. We see that phraseology, the true king. Randy asked the question, you know, kind of what is the difference between the kingdoms that we see now and the kingdom to come that came out of Psalm 145? And you think about it. I mean, you even look at God's chosen people's history, the Israelites and then those in the Judah kingdom below. They had like three and a half good kings in hundreds of years. That's a difference between human kingdoms and God's kingdom to come. Also, if you think about it, Queen Elizabeth, right? The longest 
living monarch in the Tudor dynasty. She's going to pass away. What's the next monarch going to look like? Is it, are they going to be fair? Are they going to be good? You just don't know. I mean, you look at the line of the Tudors and Henry VIII, and, you know, you look at that. that those kingdoms, you don't know what you're going to get because they're human. Will they look out for us? Will they look out for you? Will they look out for themselves? So we bring in the king of kings, whose kingdom is completely different. A kingdom full of peace and love. And yet this king lay thus in a lowly manger. The servant king, as Isaiah emphasizes in multiple places, this king that came looks like no other king in history came as a servant, came in a lowly situation, was one of us, was one of the people. Not only that, but he came to this earth and he experienced everything that you're experiencing. Temptation, struggle, people in pain. He experienced all that. Loss of a friend, those difficult things. And so when it says to our weakness, he is no stranger. We serve a God who's experienced our pain, who's experienced our difficulty, who has experienced our struggle. Behold our king, before him we bow down. And once again, I think it's amazing that we've been, we were talking about stars in Bible class, and then we see so many stars pop up in this particular carol. So tomorrow is a big day, isn't it? Because after that, then we start to get a couple more minutes of daylight, right? Everybody excited? I am. But it's also about 45 minutes after sunset, you're supposed to be able to see what's called the Christmas star, where Saturn and Jupiter line up and they're going to be the closest that they're going to get, which is millions of miles away, but to us, closest that they're going to get in the last 800 years. It's supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to be clear tomorrow night, so hopefully we can see it. But just that imagery of the stars brightly shining and the stars guiding it's really important as we look at this poem because who is guiding you we obviously go to the magi and who was guiding them was this star that was put before them and there's some really cool things that i learned in seminary that i've held on to for many many years and so that's why i love matthew 2 especially so if you have your bibles turn to that we're going to spend a couple minutes in matthew 2 because this is we're continuing in the christmas story Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Now we have to get these visitors, these curious people who come from a different country. So verse 1 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, not a very good time to be alive, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And so the Herods, those are the puppet kings, if you will, that kind of do whatever Rome wants to try to keep the peace in Israel, specifically in Jerusalem. Now, there was Herod the Great and Herod Antipas and brothers and sisters who were Herods, and most of them were not good people. They weren't good people. So when you have a group of foreign kings, as we often translate it, more on that in a minute, who come to visit you and say, hey, hey, where's the king of the Jews? And you think you're the king of the Jews. There's going to be some issues, for sure. And we'll see that in a second. But the thing that kind of really blew me away in one of my uh, Old Testament classes was this word magi. This word magi, which means astrologer, astronomer, wise man. That's why we call them the wise men. Dates all the way back to Daniel. So Daniel, just real quick, Daniel was one of the real heroes of the Old Testament. He's a young man who gets taken into this foreign country, serves multiple kings for Assyria and Babylon, and he is this incredible witness for the one true God while he is there. He and his friend Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so through God's intervention, he gets put into a leadership position, and he is one of the Magi. That's what the word means. One of the wise men. Somebody who interprets dreams. Somebody who helps the king work through things. 
And so more than likely, 600 years before Jesus came, Daniel talked about a Savior to come, a King of Kings, probably even quoted some of the prophecies that had been handed down orally to these men from a foreign land that he is now serving with. 600 years later, these same, obviously, ancestors, descendants, have come to see the true king. Never, ever downplay what your life can be as an example or what your words, when you share them about Jesus, can do. 600 years later, sure, Daniel saw some pretty cool things happen in his ministry, in Babylon and Assyria, he saw God working, but he really didn't get to see the true outcome of what happens by seeing this one true king arrive. Amen. And so it's, it's really cool when you kind of link that together. You may never know the impact of your witness of Jesus Christ, Amen. but we are still called to be a witness. And so the natural thing happens, King Herod gets disturbed and all the people with him. So the Herods, uh, some of them probably were certifiably psychotic. They were definitely paranoid. They would have relatives killed. They would have their own kids killed so they couldn't ascend the throne. So he finds out that there's another king, and all Jerusalem is also disturbed as well. They know that this is a man who is capable of anything. And so they're, they're scared. Once again, that's what human kingdoms can be like as opposed to godly kingdoms. And so he calls all the chief priests together and the teachers of the law, and he asks them, where is the Messiah to be born? And they said, in Bethlehem and Judea, back to Micah 5.2, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. For this is what the prophet Micah has written, but you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be a shepherd of my people Israel. And so Herod hears the very words. This is the Jewish puppet king. Hears the words of what is supposed to be his scriptures, and he should be overjoyed and put himself aside so that the true king can be raised up. That, that's not what's going to happen. He definitely is not like John the Baptist who says, I must become less so that he, Jesus, can become greater. Herod is the opposite of that. He's going to do anything he can to get rid of this king. But he's going to make it look good. Then Herod called the Magi secretly. Hey guys, come on in here. And found out from them the exact time that that star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do when the true Savior, the true King of the world comes. You're supposed to go and worship him like O Holy Knight says multiple times. And Psalm 145 says, Bow down and worship. And so, like I said, Herod makes it look good, like that's what he wants to do. And the wise men are all, well, we don't know any better. So they head off to Bethlehem to see what they could find out. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were naturally overjoyed. 600 years of history of our forefathers, our ancestors, seeking this particular king of kings. And we find him. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country, their country by another route. It always amazes me at times, and it shouldn't amaze me, when you look through the Old Testament and then you see a passage like this, that God will speak to people who may not be necessarily following him or truly understand who he is. God will use foreign kings who don't believe in him yet. God will use 
wise men like this to go and bring this child born into a stable in a poorest of conditions will bring him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which will help his parents raise him practically and physically. God's plan just, he covers all the bases as he, we see his plan unfold. And so they do what you would normally do when you see the king. You would bow down and worship him and give him gifts. Once again, unlike what Herod would do. I'm reminded of this passage in 1 Timothy. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. That is the King of kings. He is the one who lives in light. He is the light of the world. And continuing on in the third stanza. So, need for a savior. The savior has come in this lowly feeding trough. And so now what do you do with that information? I mean, that's the big question that comes out of this hymn. It is so deep. You have to react. You have to act. You can't just let it sit there. Either you're going to say, oh, I totally believe that. He is the savior. I'm going to make him my Lord. Or you're not. And you're just going to think this is just one of those fun little things you sing around a tree. And it doesn't mean anything. And so, once again, the words are so powerful, especially in this stanza. I mean, ask yourself, do you want to be in a kingdom like this, where love unites, where people who were held in chains physically, emotionally, spiritually, those chains are now broken? Do you love one another? His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break. All oppression shall cease. Remember, this second version is written by an abolitionist who has watched mankind subject other men and women to slavery. I mean, that visualization of what true chains are, where you can't break free, you are in bondage, you need help from someone to set you free. I mean, it even enters our popular culture, a very famous uh, monarch in a TV series recently was called The Breaker of Chains. It's inherent that we know that there is something going on in this world that is not right. And we have the answer, Jesus Christ the Savior. He will make it right. And so, breaking the chains, being subjected to another human being, horrific conditions, that unfortunately some of mankind have been in, but all of us at one time were under spiritual chains and spiritual oppression. And God has intervened in our lives and we see more clearly and we are free, as we talked about too, Randy, right? In Psalm 145, we are free to worship. So leading up to these carols, I listened to a ton of different versions. Okay, that's how I found the a cappella version that I showed you earlier. One version that I really, really liked is one by Carrie Underwood. It's in a new album she just released, and she actually makes a change. So I want to go back to, oops, can you go back, Dave? Sorry, I went the wrong way. I think I got it. I got it now. Because the original, just the way, so, sorry, I went too far. My bad. I should know my text. Right, so, chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Powerful message, okay? Carrie Underwood then says, for his child is our brother, Jesus is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. So think about it, as you read the book of Acts or other passages in the New Testament, people will remove demons or heal other people, and they do it in the name of Jesus. That is a powerful name. And so the oppression, the spiritual oppression, those who are lost, those who are still in darkness, at the name of Jesus is how they will be lifted out of that. How the oppression will stop, how they will be brought into the light. And it's just a different way to look at it. And another thing that pops in when you think about this phraseology, so you have 
brothers, if we are all God's children and brothers and sisters who are subjecting other brothers and sisters, children of God, to slavery. This is pointing to them and saying, that is wrong. We should not treat our fellow human beings that way. Powerful, powerful. And so some scriptures that come to mind, back to the Psalms once again, just in breaking the chain. Psalm 107, verse 10, There were those who lived in darkness and in the shadow of death. I was one of those at one time. Prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God and rejected the plan of the Most High. They heard his words, they heard about him, they heard people talk about him, they saw his miraculous creation, but yet they chose not to follow him. They rejected God's plan. Verse 13, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. They shall give thanks to the Lord his, for his mercy and for his wonders to the sons of mankind. For he has shattered gates of bronze and cut off bars of iron. Those who are in prison to sin can be set free. Amen. And 1 Corinthians 5 has a great reminder. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Once again, that question, now that you've heard, now that you know who the Savior is, what do you do about it? That God was reconciling the world to himself by sending his son Jesus, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That word, we use it a lot. I mean, it's a churchy word for sure, but it's also an accounting term. And I, I, I love looking at it as an accounting term where you're trying to make the books, you're trying to make everything line up, you're trying to make everything in harmony. I wish, uh, you know, CJ and D were here to help me with this, okay? That's what you, what's that? Balance, right, exactly, harmony. And so that is what the ministry of reconciliation is. And I saw this wonderful thought that because it included chains and breaking free, the freedom that comes when you live aligned with God. So the big question is, what would a reconciled, harmonized world look like? A place of peace, a place of hope, a place of joy. Can we, as the church, the body, as individuals and as a group, bring that into our world? You bet we can. Are we supposed to? Yes. Now, will true harmonization come now? Not yet. But we're supposed to work towards it. It will come, however, when Jesus Christ comes back and brings in the new heaven and the new earth. All will be harmonized. All will be brought together. All will be consistent. All will be balanced. All will be aligned. But we can't look at it as just something in the future. And say, God's got this. Yes, I'm quoting for our Tuesday morning book. But it is the truth. We need to live in that understanding now. We are his agents on earth. We have a ministry of reconcili reconciliation. The same ministry that his son had. That's our ministry. Amen. That's our ministry. Yes, fallen world. We have fallen short. But God provided an answer. And I just want to end with John 1. It's often not used in Christmas stories because there is no birth of Jesus per se, no manger scene, no wise men, no angels showing up to Mary and Joseph and others. But the words are really profound. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, Jesus Christ is the Word, was God and is God. He was with God in the beginning. When it all started, in God's timing, there is no start. It just happened. He existed. But for our sake, he says, in the beginning, the beginning of time, the beginning of creation, through him all things were made. He was a part of that creation, and he is still recreating us. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. 
Don't you want a king who brings life? And that life was the light of all mankind. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is our king. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So remember, when you look at those stars, they're going to be out and bright. They pale in comparison to our king. Those stars are only a reflection of the light. You know what we're called to be? A reflection of the light. Reflect him this week. A few weeks ago, we sang this song, and I had comments. Uh, people enjoyed it, but this again is a song that has a message, right? That we have stories to tell, and uh, we need to be about that. Let's stand as we sing this. If you weren't here a couple weeks ago, we got some new stuff at the beginning and the end. Okay. Go and tell it. Go, go and tell about it. Go and tell it. Go, go and tell about it. Go, go and tell it. Go, go and tell about it. Go, go and tell it. Go, go and tell about it. Go, go and tell it. Go, go and tell about it. Go, go and tell it. Go, go and tell about it. Go, go and tell it. these things, but I hate them. <laughs> I'll be glad when we can get back to normal. It's been a wonderful week, a crazy week, but God has blessed us all the way through because we're here. Will you pray with me, please? Most holy, loving, heavenly Father, God in heaven, 
you and you alone are the Holy One. You are the Creator, and you have created us to be eternal beings, to spend eternity with you. And that is the hope that we all have, is to spend eternity with you. We thank you, Holy Father, for the blessing of this day. We thank you for the blessing of this opportunity to gather together, to worship you, to sing songs of praise to you, to fellowship with one another, even if it is from a distance, and to share your love with the world around us. Father, we're coming into the time of the year that we celebrate the birth of your son. And we pray that you will bless each and every one of us, whether they're here physically or watching us online or someplace else in this world. Guide your children, please, Holy Father. For those who are traveling, we pray for safe travels. We pray that the families will be able to get together to worship you, to show their love for you by sharing with others who are less privileged. Help us, Holy Father, to live an example of Jesus to everyone that we encounter. Help us to love as you love. And help us, please, to be a light on a hill and salt in the life of the people that we encounter. Help us to stand true and strong and faithful to you regardless of what happens. Thank you, Holy Father, for all these blessings. Thank you for sending us out to serve you this week. And thank you for bringing us all together again, either physically or virtually in the coming week. Thank you for all this. In Jesus' holy name.